and Sahit, and they will be presenting on the Human Genome Project and gene annotation today. So everybody welcome Sahit and Keith. Hi, I'm Sahit, for people who don't know the online audience. And I'm Kian, and we'll be presenting on gene annotation in Drosophila species today. The Human Genome Project was a project conceived by the United States government and several international partners in 1990. The Human Genome Project has a goal of creating the, the in complete sequence of the human genome, all of the bases that, that make up our genetic material. This project, when it was conceived in 1990, was estimated to take 15 years to complete. They finished it in 13 in 2003. But what most people don't know is humans were not one of the first or was not the first organism sequenced in the Human Genome Project. This one was instead. The Drosophila melanogaster is a species of fruit fly that's commonly found in tropical in tropical areas. The fruit Drosophila melanogaster was one of, was the first fruit fly species to have its genome fully sequenced and annotated before humans. Over the years, it has served as an important model organism in studying knockout, knockout studies, which allow us to inactivate a gene and see what happens to the fly itself, as well as an allelic variation, as well as an allelic variation, such as incomplete dominance. These traits have been useful in helping us study things like eye color and multi-gene traits. As such, that it has served as a, as, a as a model organism for us to study for years. What, what, did, well, what did the Human Genome Project do for genomics as a whole? The first thing that it did is it, is it lowered the time that it takes to sequence a genome. It, take, it took 13 years to create the first human genome. Today, the Harvard laboratories can run it in under 24 hours. It also made it less expensive. In 2001, as you can see in the graph here, it cost $100 million to run the, the first human, one, uh, a human genome. It, today it takes about five thousand dollars, and this and this redu reduction in cost has allowed us to expand our resources exponentially across many species. We now have genomes for thousands of species, but once we have all of these A's, C's, T's, and G's, what can we do with them? Well, we can annotate them through gene annotation. So, with gene annotation, what we can do is locate the genes in a certain sequence that we have find them and find what their shape is like and where the exons and introns are located. And with that, we can find the protein structure. And that will basically tell us what its function is and several other things. From there, we can, we can see how different species have differentiated over time. And overall, we can basically see a general idea of how an organism works. What we do in gene annotation is split, split a giant sequence into certain pieces. These pieces are called contigs. And that's what we'll basically use throughout the entire presentation, these certain pieces. They're each labeled a certain number, and that's just a certain portion of the sequence. Now, there's a couple of things that, you need, that we're looking for when you're annotating the gene. The first are the, are the exons. These are the coding regions of the protein uh, that, actually will, that actually will be used to, cre to create the protein. For these re regions, not only do you want to know their location, you also want to know, you also want to know their length, uh, as well as their exact sequences. This way you can determine exactly what amino acid chain is going to be built. You also want to know the location of the intervening regions or the introns. These regions don't actually code for protein, but they intersect, the, but they divide the gene up into smaller pieces. These you just want to know their, loca their location, so you know which, which uh, nucleotides are not being translated. You, uh, in order to find the location of the of the intron, you need to find two structures, the splice donor and splice acceptor. These essentially tell the cell where it needs to be cut the DNA chain in order to form the complete messenger RNA. The splice donor is, is denoted by, a, by GT in the nucleotide sequence. This, this sequence allows the splice donor to be able to say cut here because uh, it's the end of the exon. The, the splice acceptor has a similar nucleotide sequence, AG. This tells the cell where to, where to finish cutting out the intron and bring together the two exons. Knowing, knowing where these are can help you find other introns as well as the exons and you both locate your full gene. So, how do you actually annotate a gene? Well, first of all, we need to use a certain program called BLAST. This is basically stands for the Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. What it does is that it takes a sequence from another species that's very similar 
and takes your entire sequence and aligns it to see where the genes are, where a certain gene may be located. From that, you can get a certain result. If you see above, there's a certain picture here that has an alignment. At the very bottom are all the amino acid sequences. The middle shows the differences, and as you can see, at amino acid bases 1 through 96, that's where a general exon may lie. <coughs> There's a set, once, you, once you're done with fine mapping the coordinates, sorry, once you're done with crude mapping the coordinates, you need to then fine map them. BLAST can give you a good idea of locally where the, two, or where the gene is, however, you actually need to do fine mapping in order to determine its exact coordinates. To do that, we have several, we have several programs that are used to help. First is this BLAST alignment tool here. This takes the location of Drosophila melanogaster pro, uh, genes, which, which we know their exact position, and lays them onto the section of the context. This allows us to have some context as to where some genes might actually lie. These genes, uh, from, the, from the blast alignment, we can get a general idea on where an analogous gene should be in, on another species, in this case, Drosophila elegans. The next is the, is the band right here called the ab initio programs. These are, gene prediction, so these are gene prediction programs that take a variety of techniques in order to pr predict a gene and its location. As you can see, they all, differ very, they all have large differences in between their predictions in terms of the number of genes and size. As such, you can use them to, to gauge potential gene scenarios. Below you have what are known as the splice, as the splice predictors. These, uh, tell, these take all of the AGs and the GTs in the sequence and rate them upon whether they are a highly likely splice predictor, uh, a highly likely splice site, or a low likely splice site. But perhaps the most important track are these three bottom ones right here. These three bottom ones right here are RNA sequence data. They are, uh, when this genome was sequenced in terms of DNA, the RNA fragments were also extracted as well and sequenced and aligned to this context. If, there is, if there's a high amount of RNA sequence data, as can be seen here, it likely means that there's a gene there since the RNA is being transcribed. So, back to how these programs work. They each, all the, almost all of them, work with the, use the general, generalized hidden macro model. This is just a basic idea, a basic tool, or a basic model that takes in several accounts, several things to get a general predictive result. These basically are, uh, Splice sites, which are the splice receptors and splice donors, that will tell where the exons are generally. It also takes in previously annotated DNA. So other species who have similar exons, similar genes, they will take that and use it as a, as a surrogate and help in order to predict certain areas. And finally, it will use open reading frames. Open reading frames are uh, areas where there's no stop codons, which basically end the sequence. So if there's no stop codon, there's more, it's most likely that there's a gene there. And that's what they basically use. There's several variations of this. And that's how each program is able to predict different results. So, we start with fine mapping. In order to fine map, we use these certain programs in order to find the general area where a star codon is. The star codon is marked by three nucleotide bases, A, T, and G. And here, you can see it there. That basically is the star codon. It's usually marked on green on the three tracks you see up there. And that basically tells you, here it is, the start of the G. Next, we go to the end of the first exon. This is where you'll find a splice donor site. And that is marked by a GT. This is where usually most of the programs end. As you can see above, most of those prediction programs suddenly drop off, including the RNA-seq data. From that, you can tell that the splice site is right there, and the, G, and the gene or the exon ends right before it. The next part to find is the, is the first splice acceptor. This is the start of the second exon. Again, it's no, denoted by the nucleotide sequence AG, so it's these letters up here at the very top. And similar to the splice donor, it's where all the programs begin, as well as the RNA-seq data. In this slide, it would be about here. This is where the RNA-seq data begins to have higher peaks, as well as all the ab initio programs. And the, splice per, and the splice predictor gives it a high, gives it a high uh, prediction that it will be a, that'll be a splice site. You repeat this entire process for all of your for all of your exons, finding their splice donors and their splice acceptors. The last step will be to find the stop codon of the last exon, which is marked here in red. So now that we have this this uh, sequence of the peptides, 
what can we actually do with this? So the first thing that we can do is evaluate it for conservation with other species. Conservation with other species is how similar is this amino acid sequence with another, with another species. It allows us to see important proteins across species that, that are conserved and are used in functioning for both species. So for, uh, if it has a high likely conservation, this means that function is likely very much conserved. If it has a lower conservation, it probably isn't as much. We also have, the, we also have um, protein, predi protein predictions as well. From the amino acid sequence, you can determine what the exact same amino acid sequence. And finally, all the letters in between are the exact same. And as you can tell, there's a lot of letters of the exact same, so it's very highly conserved. So, an example of a highly conserved gene that we found is CYP7. Its function was basically to uh, enact transmission of, cal of calcium ions. And this basically tells you how like, it basically is fast action in your nervous system. It's pretty highly conserved, shown on the right in the dot plot. And its function is also very highly conserved. This dot plot on the right is kind of a little weird. So I have a problem explain it to you. On the horizontal axis, you see Drosophila neuroengaster's entire sequence of CYP7. That, each band that goes up equals a certain exon. On the vertical, ac on the vertical axis, you see Drosophila elegans is CYP7. And each band that goes from left to right equals another exon. When they intersect, you see a square. And you see a line that goes through that square. That is basically where both, where, if this is the area where both genes lie in the exact same area and that there's similarity. The line that goes from the bottom left to the top right basically shows how good and how strong the similarity you see. If there's a strong similarity, there's usually a dot and it creates a line. You can, you can see here in C7, it's a very strong line. Since there are fewer gaps, smaller gaps, and not, and not many, it's a very highly conserved. However, on the next gene, you will not see that. This gene is CG1674. It, its dot plot, as can be uh, as can be seen, is very different from is very different from C7. It's located on context 51 of the of the genome, but not all of it is located there. As you can see, there are three. There are, the dot plot does not end directly in the upper left-hand corner. This is because these three exons are missing from context 51. They're actually located on nearby context 50. So those exons have not been evaluated for conservation. However, the first, uh, the first set of exons clearly has very little sequence similarity with Drosophila melanogaster. Because of this, the, it likely means that these exons are not important to function, or this gene is not, or this gene is not important to the function of Drosophila elegans overall. This could, this can yield many, this can yield many different results. If it is still transcribed, then it could be, it could now have a completely different function. The next thing that you can do is evaluate it for protein, is for protein predictions. This essentially is software that is used to predict the shape of the protein, which can give insights into its overall function. The, ser the software that we used for this project was called RaptorX. It's a server run by the University of Chicago. What it does is it takes a large protein database of proteins that have already been studied through X-ray crystallography and their structure as well as their sequence. It then takes a look at sequence similarity between your protein and this protein database and attempts to build your protein using a template. Similar, similar sequences of amino, of amino acids will fold into similar shapes and this allows you to get a full idea of its secondary and tertiary structure. It is common for alpha helices, which are rotating amino acids, so it will be denoted in pink, and beta plated sheets, long plates that align to each other, to be denoted in yellow, in yellow arrows. This is an example of one of the predictions that has come up through, through Raptor X. The gene is called CG31999. The, per, the protein itself was, predict, was predicted, as you, can see, as you can see here, to be mostly made of uncoiled and disordered proteins, other than a couple of few uh, small alpha helices and a small amount of beta plated sheets. Uh, this protein is also located on contact, on contact 51 and, uh, and has been known to be transcribed in uh, an organ called the malphagian tubules. Uh, which is responsible for the digestion of the cell, it, it functions as its gut, as well as in the exoskeleton itself. 
if you if you see here, there are two binding sites that have been predicted by the by the RaptorX server. The first is this calcium binding site here. If you look at the green at the green orb in the picture, that is where a calcium ion would bind with certain amino acids. On the right, you have the uh, you have the separate binding site that binds to a model called N-acetyl glucocyanine. Uh, this uh, this molecule is responsible for the build is is a a building block in a structure known as chitin, which is comprised, which is comprised of everything, which comprises everything from an insect exoskeleton to your fingernails. As such, of good, using this protein prediction, we can we can guess as to what its function is. Its function likely has to deal with the breakdown or the um, or the creation of chitin of long chitin chains from this n acetyl d glucosyanine. Next, we have another example of a gene that has been predicted by Raptor X. This one was slightly more controversial than the other, but it, was still, it still provides helpful results. It was located on contact 21, and it only had moderate conservation with Drosophila melanogaster. It was highly transcribed in female ovaries, provided by Flybase, and its potential function was several different things, including cell destruction and much more. Here on the next slide, you can see that there's three different types of proteins that were predicted. On the far left, this protein here was predicted to have to deal with cell degradation and the destruction of cellular structures. The one in the middle, this had to deal with Rab proteins, proteins that are on the cellular membrane that allow molecules to pass through and help them function. Finally, on the very right, you can see a gene that deals with gene suppression and uh, exertion, and it will suppress or make genes expressed. This will just basically bind onto a certain uh, DNA sequence, and this, this will allow it to be suppressed or expressed. So now that we have these, pro these protein structures, their sequences, and their conservation, what can we actually do with them? Why, do, why should we care about fruit fly genes? Fruit flies have been used as a model organism for more complex ones for years. With its knockout studies and its allelic variations, we can see that, we can see that fruit flies serve as a, good, as a good model to determine how genes interact in humans. By having the complete genome sequenced and annotated, we can see exactly what genes are being are affecting these these observations that we're seeing. What causes a fly, what causes a fly to have an incompletely dominant eye where it becomes pink instead of red or white? It also allows us to see evolutionary changes between fruit fly species. This gives us a good insight as into the components of divergence and convergence evolution, how species differentiate themselves and become and become new ones. It also, it, but it also can give us insights into, into, our, into ourselves. Proteins that are similar in other species, as well as humans, are, can be useful in, in, helping, in helping with disease. So the next great idea from medicine may not come from some sort of chemical. It may come from studying a fruit fly gene. Here are some of our, ref, here are our references for our projects and our, and our, as well as our image references, as well as our, um, as well as our acknowledgments. Any questions? At this point, at this point, we would like to at this point we would like to thank a couple of our sponsors. Thank you so much to the Zimmerly family and Union Pacific for funding our research, as uh, in as well as our room and board here. We couldn't have done it without you. And I'd like to thank Twenty Family Foundation, the Kinder Morgan Foundation, for room and board and helping us fund this project. We'd also like to thank Dr. Judith Leatherman for mentoring our project, as well as grad students who helped us in our lab, Jordan McCarthy and James Major. And we'd also like to thank our advisor, Nicole, for helping us get this presentation together. Any questions? Yes, Grace? 